News of no-go zones in London and Birmingham are sweeping the UK as the internet falls in love with a shoddily put together scam event that is designed to swindle people from their money that was helmed by a kind of serial con artist. Jeremy Corbyn has just become leader of the Labour Party, and we are excited to see if socialism will come to Britain here in 2017. Oh, I love mm. being in 2017. Mm. It, yeah. the, the last year that it's going to be before everything gets so much better, I assume. Yes. Yeah. That's what D. Ream wrote that song mm. about. Yeah. <laughs> it's the free one. Things can only get better in 20 years' time. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No, no, no. It is 2024. Yeah, you hit your head really <laughs> hard. Yeah. I'm so sorry to have to tell you this, but it turns out that Jeremy Corbyn was actually uh, a member of uh, kind of like Hamas, I guess. I was surprised too. Our version of the uh, scammy event now no longer taking place in the uh, beautiful mm. uh, islands of the Caribbean, but in sunny Glasgow instead. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm always in favor of regionalization. The Scottish economy doesn't get nearly enough attention. And given that the British economy is mostly scams, it's nice to see that, you know, things are moving up here and we as a city are diversifying beyond burning down historic buildings to turn into student flats. Yeah, was Jarul involved in the Willy Wonka experience? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jarul was banned from the UK. Like, um, did yeah. you see the Instagram post he posted where he was like, "Yeah, I'm not allowed to come to the UK, so I can't play any of my UK shows." So, mm, bit suspicious. He would have enhanced the Willy Wonka's chocolate experience. One Jarul for him, quite enough <laughs> <laughs> for everyone else. Oh God! I'm sure most people listening to this will have seen the fabulous Willy's chocolate experience. In <laughs> the fabulous chocolate <laughs> Willy experience. Yeah, I've been on a Hendy. The fabulous chocolate experience that was <laughs> sold. <laughs> a fabulous chocolate experience of a nature we're not going to get into here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The Lintmaster chocolatiers of the fabulous experience. Hiring a kind of like stripper Lintmaster chocolatier. Oh, yeah. Just tearing off the chef's wine. At this chocolate experience, you were going to get to enjoy... And churning and ent entertainment, uh, including Karchi tons, cat cacating, and uh -huh. exhaustray yeah. lollipops. Yeah, I think yeah. I saw them at the academy one time. <laughs> yeah, because it's AI generated advertising materials. Mm -hmm. I love how quickly that's become a case of like, not only are we generating all of our advertising materials with AI, but we can't even be bothered to correct the text in them that makes no sense. We're just like, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, th this is this this was what happens if you do the bare minimum now is everything is sort of like uncorrected AI text and weird AI images. And so this this like chocolate event had backdrops that were just printouts of AI images looking really shit and disconcerting at the same time. My view on Willie's chocolate experience. My when I have decided, I have looked at all the evidence, I've weighed it up in my mind, okay. I have put it in front... Yeah. Like a high court judge. I have put it in front of my mental star chamber, and I have determined yeah. that this is the single best piece of art that materially involves AI. Why is that? <laughs> yeah. Why is that? I mean, this is the thing, right? I, I think this existed before AI, right? This kind of scam... We've seen it happen before of like uh, parents taking their kids to the like winter wonderland or whatever, yeah. uh, and Santa is like a stolen H and M mannequin that's having its sort of like arm gnawed off by like yeah. an XL bully that's disguised as a reindeer, right? Like this is a <laughs> it's it's a known fact in this country that like if you try and take your kids to an event, you will be mm. punished for hubris, right? Because your kids, uh, you know, fuck them, they're gonna get enough events as they grow up anyway, like. Yeah, climate events. Exactly, yeah. Like, once in a hundred year events will be happening to them pretty much hourly by the time they, they reach adulthood. So, like, yeah, to take them to, like, a Christmas event or some kind of strange Willy Wonka-themed event is, is courting disaster. But mm. what's happened here is that, like, that uh, sort of, like, baseline of this is obviously going to be a scam, it's going to be done with, like, the minimal effort required is now AI enabled. And while that doesn't make it much more efficient, it does make it much stranger. Precisely correct. Yeah. <laughs> the example I think of here, right, is 
these very odd uh, characters and stage directions that the uh, that chat GPT essentially inserted into this performance. If you're sitting down in front of an AI and you're like, I'm going to make some good art by writing a prompt. You are hamstrung by your very efforts. You will, it will never succeed. If you sit down in front of an AI and think, I can use this. I can put this AI, some actors, and some gullible parents together to make a quick buck, and I don't care what comes out the other side of it. Then you are using AI correctly because what you you are yeah. then generating. You are Marina Abramovich accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the thing, right? The 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 hill that I'm willing to die on, right, in order to excuse myself for occasionally using it for shit posts, is that AI can never be good, but it can be funny. Right, and I don't think there yes. are many human writers that would have come up with the concept of introducing a villain into the Willy Wonka, ch- like uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Who's not Willy Wonka? Yeah, canon called the unknown. Like, <laughs> yeah, awesome. I mean, I'm sure again, most people will know this because it's been now endlessly covered because it's just so odd. But the inserting a kind, our first proper meme of 2024 uh, feels know? good. Uh, in, but of inserting a kind of randomly generated villain into Willy Wonka, that, but then, crucially, giving that character to a local Glasgow act, Glaswegian actor to kind of just do his best at kind of improvising. I'm the unknown. <laughs> you didn't <he> can me. <laughs> the, the poor fucking Oompa Loompa lady. She was interviewed in Vulture, and again, you, you get the sense that, like, uh, this all existed before AI. You know, if you were a stand-up comedian or a, a, an actor who was like looking for work, a lot of this stuff would be coming your way anyway. But mm. really, to just be handed like a small bag of jelly beans, a script written by ChatGPT, and to have like some Glaswegian children thrown at you and be like, "Go on!" Fucking. I don't think there was even a bag of jelly beans. I think it was one jelly bean and half a half a cup of lemonade <laughs> of like cheap Tesco lemonade. Mm. Incredible. <laughs> It's also like a really interesting like case study. I think of like when when like you know because the whole premise is, of, of like the AI boosters has been that this will sort of facilitate uh, human beings in sort of everyday situations. It will elevate their processes. It will sort of streamline them. It will make everything more effective. And so even if like you know things are a bit patchy, like you know ultimately it'll be fine. And I think this is the, one of the good examples of like no, this is what happens when a human is sort of kind of directed by AI in the way that these systems are designed. It just becomes this very weird and odd and like detaching experience, and like mm. the whole aesthetic, the whole of the aesthetics around it. I mean, partly this isn't. I I, I don't want to sort of like blame the. AI. I think the AI is just like one layer, like an extra layer on top of this that makes it both more funny and absurd. I think you know this is very much like sort of reminiscent of a British experience more broadly, like very half-assed, costs way too much, mm. basically tells you to fuck off at the same time. Yeah. But the AI element of it just adds like this other sense of both apathy and like lack of care and just again it's like another layer of just telling telling you to go fuck yourself well, it's it's britain is the country that invented painting a horse like a like a zebra and saying five or a look or fuck off you know mm-hmm. yeah 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 it's a great noble national tradition you know? my favorite yeah. thing about it is like the image of like the wonka the ai wonka image that is sort of taped to a wall it doesn't even fill the whole wall it's like this really <laughs> Like it almost like just slightly bigger than a free page, but it's just taped. It's just taped onto a wall, and there's like a there's a what do you call it? There's like a um uh not like a barricade, but like there's like a like an arch that bit. No, like that thing that like sort of blocks. You know, oh fuck, I, I don't know. Oh uh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, like like, like a crowd control barrier. Like a crowd control mm. barrier, but like, it's just so yeah, because you don't want the children attacking the AI Willy Wonka bit. Yeah, you wouldn't want them to think that it's actually real, and they might be able to go through that tunnel. Which is sellotape to a wall and not even like properly straight. I think this is a key element of it, right? Is that what's so funny about it is that they put the funniest possible level of effort in, which was not none. Like mm. I've seen, I've seen actually worse than I think. Like the Winter Wonderland one was worse. Like there were weirdly ornate bits of this. Like there was like a big <laughs> archway and stuff, and there was like the woman, like the like the woman in the Oompa Loompa costume, like doing her best. And then there's other things, which, as you say, is just like a picture of Willy Wonka taped to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But coming back, I think, right, the, the by the way, the, the, the funny thing, I think, was the, um, the unknown was attempting to steal Willy's anti-graffiti gobstopper, which, mm. where, what piece of deranged fanfic 
did ChatGPT hoover this out of? This is right. This is like a, an assembly that my uh, senior school headmaster would have given. Like this is this is my anti graffiti gobstopper. <laughs> and if I see any of you graffitiing the lockers around the school, I'm going to suck, suck, suck on my anti graffiti gobstopper, <laughs> and it's going to tell me who did it. So <laughs> sounds like a very. And then I shall become it. leader of the Labour Party. He was very Starmer. <laughs> he really. I mean, he didn't sound like Starmer, but he had like uh, he had like a, a moustache, and he wore those like. <laughs> You know those like thick school shoes that like the unfortunate children had to wear at primary <laughs> school. Like he used to wear a pair of those with a suit, and uh, and he used to give very long speeches in assembly about like incredibly boring topics about like the time he tried to build a wall and failed and what this taught him about you know like the spirit of perseverance or whatever. <laughs> what I think is just so what I find compelling about this isn't any particular element of it, but rather that the everything about it was so AI generated and AI generation. AI generated sort of scripts, or ch- at least if you mm. use chat, the free version of ChatGPT, which he clearly has. This is mm. not GPT four. This is three point five. Yeah, has has certain ways of because um, like I've I've experimented with possibly using it to run a paranoia game mm. where you are um, basically troubleshooters working for a computer that is insane, which I think it kind of would work well for. But it has very these strange circular ways of talking. It tends to always sort of go back to where it started, and if you and asking it to write a play where it doesn't just include stage directions but also audience reactions, but then glosses over details such as well, and then Willie uh, Wonka defeats the the unknown by hoovering him up with a um with a Dyson or whatever, which is what was in the script here. Mm. It ju- that but then to give that to people and be like, well, go on, do this. You know, mm. it is it is it is finally taken. This is why I think it is it is ultimately good AI art because it is asking people to take seriously something very weird and perturbing. Hmm. And it also gave us the picture of that kid dressed as an Oompa Loompa giving two thumbs down. Yeah. The the, the reverse Trump. Equally orange but different in affect. Like like the prestige <laughs> is not doing a shitty thing uh, and trying to like make off with the money. The prestige is to do this and have everyone actually trying their best to make it happen. Mm, uh, and, yeah. and being let down only by the strangeness of like the the hallucinations that the a, a poorly prompted AI is unable to stop making. Well, yeah. Well, I thought about for a minute, like, what would I have done if I had been hired to work at this for the day? And honestly, just thinking about it, like, gave me a panic attack. <laughs> like the idea of being the the, the fucking the stand up comedian that they hired to be Willy Wonka. I was like, yeah. this is hell. This is this is hell for stand up comedians. Yeah, hell for stand up comedians. It's not the stag party that never stops pi- joining in. It is Willie's chocolate experience. Yeah, mm. I was bringing the stag party to Willie's chocolate experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, not the chocolate Willie experience, which the stag party are very much engaging in. <laughs> the other fun thing before we move on about this was, of course, the guy who put it on is addicted to like scammy AI based content. As soon as ChatGPT was released, he had like, you know, seven quite conspiratorial books out on Amazon that were, again, clearly AI generated. It's, it's just awesome. chancing, right? And like, the thing is, we, we've, we've been proven right about a bunch of stuff again when we said that like pretty soon your job's going to be like as shit, except slightly more shit because it's going to be like supervised by an AI. But the other thing is that like, it was extremely unpopular for obvious reasons, and you got a lot of very funny videos of this guy standing behind a bouncer he had hired while a uh, sort of angry parent shouted at him. <laughs> I think it just it just goes to show that like, yeah, this stuff is gonna be foisted on you, but like everyone hates it. And it's really obvious when it's being used. And <laughs> people just uh, you know, know that they're being sold a bill of goods and know and, that it's yeah. shit. And it's also sort of telling about the things that people did find endearing about it, which was just like the strange movements of the unknown or like the, the facial expression mm. of the woman at, who had to like play the Oompa Loompa at the meth lab. And like those are the things that like people found appealing. It's like the stuff that wasn't generated by AI, the stuff that wasn't like part of the AI instruction manual yeah. are like the things that people actually find to be like somewhat moving or interesting. And like if there's any sort of indictment as to, well, if there's any sort of like, kind of rejection of AI as sort of like a foundation, like a way of sort of kind of being creative or artistic in any form, even among people who so, sort of suggest that perhaps 
there is kind of some use for it. I think that's a good example of like, well, actually, probably not. Yeah, everyone hated it, except for the strange bits of unpredictable humanness that the humans brought. <laughs> and it, it doesn't even work enough for like a short con, right? You can't like do this, take people's money and flee town, yeah. because people take one look at it and go, D give me my money back, I'm calling the police. <laughs> this is sort yeah. of the other thing too, it's like, it would be incredibly easy, it's incredibly easy, like, I actually don't want to say it's incredibly easy because uh, I think event planning is quite hard, but... <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna do like wonka stuff like there are like several there are beats that you can sort of hit that will sort of make it passable right mm -hmm, and the thing sure. about wonka and the associations with it is like that at the very least is like have a bunch of sweets around like that could have mm. probably saved this thing but yeah, like love candy yeah. like, but like the fact that it was so low effort to the point of just like it was worse than like the shit that you know apprentice like you see on the apprentice i think is just very telling us to sort of like the reliance on this as a system kind of just means that you uh, it, it, you're almost sort of like removing or sort of ignoring all logical faculties that can be like yeah maybe this might just need like another bottle of lemonade now mm. you've organized a, a willy wonka experience but yeah you've got some geezer there called, called the unknown <laughs> well it's not even in the book karen is that in the book that's not in the book is it and then you've got you've got no sweets you've got a woman running what looks like a meth lab She's talking. To, she's giving them one jelly bean. I mean, why? Why would anyone pay thirty-five pound for that? <laughs> That's that on the Apprentice. <laughs> <laughs> we can. We can move on. We can move on. Can um, we? Can any we can. of us really move on? We're going to move this. on to yeah. Saudi Arabia, the w Willie's chocolate experience of countries. Yeah, <laughs> they would know Neom is it, like yeah. that plus time. <laughs> yeah, we've introduced the unknown into Vision Twenty Thirty. <laughs> One woman dressed as a dressed as a nomad handing out baklava. <laughs> no, no, we've we've given the unknown some rimless glasses, and mm. he he is now creating a uh, a new kind of uh, parallel line chocolate factory. I'm Torben no. unknown. <laughs> well, here's the thing though: the rimless glasses European Saudi Arabia mm. working consultants. They're getting off scot-free. That's like an Anglo-Saxon kenning, incredible sort of mm. assemblage of words there. We are looking at a possible, um, let's say, series of difficulties for American firms that are engaged in consulting with Saudi Arabia, including on projects like Neom, oh, but no. as well as projects like- But, but we love those guys. They're so likable and friendly, and mm. we definitely don't think that they in any way deserved this, or what's happening to them might be funny. Mm. So. What is happening is that a number of uh, a Senate subcommittee is investigating how Saudi Arabia is using soft power, such as sports investments and so on, to extend influence in the U.S. And so a number of consultancies, such as McKinsey, BCG, and others, were hauled up before a Senate subcommittee hearing, basically to testify exactly what they've done. So Richard Blumenthal, the, like, the person who has the, had the bee in his bonnet about this, said, we want to determine what work these companies have done and are doing that allows a foreign sovereign to use instruments in commerce of the United States to increase its influence within our shores and rebrand its tarnage, tarnished image after years of horrific human rights abuses. Me too, Richard. Me too. Sure. I, I think it's cool how the US foreign policy establishment kind of works mm -hmm. like this, where you give the Saudis everything they want for years and then like one guy gets pissed off at them for kind of an obscure reason and now the whole thing kind of pivots a little bit. Yeah. And it's a good sustainable system. Speaking know? from inside a suitcase, the McKinsey spokesperson had this to say. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially what has happened, right, is the Senate is subpoenaing a number of documents from these American companies um, as to their work in Saudi Arabia. Hmm. What, what have you been doing for like MBS? How many uh, different shapes did you propose to MBS? Yeah, what, what kind of, have you been optimizing his like bone mm. sore regimen? Yeah, they gave him access to secret shapes developed by the Pentagon. <laughs> well, they gave him access to the Pentagon. <laughs> well, they're gonna, they're gonna, no, that, that's the shape they want you to think. They want you to think they stopped there. The Pentagon has been developing secret non-Euclidean shapes. <laughs> this is something that I would fully hear like shouted into traffic by someone. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that someone is me. <laughs> the the PIF, meanwhile, the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, sued the four firms, the four the firms, namely BCG, McKinsey, and a couple other smaller ones in Saudi Arabia, claiming that the documents demanded in the U.S. were classified and could not be shared. Yeah, some of those shapes. I mean, for instance, you, you know they've got line. That's one mm. already. Yeah, uh, and then Numeraba is cube. So that's they're working very quickly. 
towards mm. a higher level yeah. of they shape. They have a quellum, which is vertical line. Yeah. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah, so, Jesus um, Christ, it's Jason Bourne. <laughs> <laughs> My God. These two, these two guys, Bob Sternfuls and Rich Lesser. Um, <laughs> I'm Rich Lesser. <laughs> Richard the Lesser and Bob the Gracer yeah, 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 yeah. are both saying, look, we can't because otherwise we will go to jail in Saudi Arabia. I, I think it's really funny for a McKinsey guy to like sail between Scylla and Charybdis like this. I also think it's really funny that considering what most of these people do for Saudi Arabia, which is like, go to MBS and be like, you should spend 12 trillion quid on golf tours. That that is something that the Saudis are like instinctively so protective of that they are willing to like threaten to jail these people. Like y- you are getting in trouble with two governments at once, and neither of them are the kind of government that you want to like particularly fuck with. And what you've done to earn that is you've gone to a meeting with MBS, been out of ideas, had your Don Draper moment, gone to the whiteboard and written get Taylor Swift to start dating a golfer. <laughs> <laughs> and for that, Mohammed bin Salman has gone, if you tell anyone about this, I will fucking bone saw you. <laughs> Do you want to move to a new city I'm building that's shaped exactly like a suitcase and is sized like a suitcase and also is a suitcase? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, new cabin luggage. Uh, the, the fucking luxury dining district in there sucks, by the way. Yeah, yeah the partnership with Samsonite that the Saudi royal family are doing. <laughs> it's like a sort of uh, dual-handed thing. You've got one one side is Samsonite, the other is Husqvarna. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, it's it's this is a new a new um a new kind of luggage for Saudis, which is which yeah, has, yeah. has a chainsaw built in. Like you can just beat mm-hmm. someone yeah, into yeah. it, yeah. like a shredder. It, it, it later turns out that much like those sort of like powered luggage things, you just can't take those on yeah. airlines. But. Have you ever been at the airport and found <laughs> that you cannot fit all of your luggage into the suitcase? Well, this is no longer a problem because of the Samsonite Husqvarna chainsaw suitcase. <laughs> for example, I cannot fit this whole journalist corpse into my suitcase, but this is no longer an issue for me. <laughs> so that's the thing, right? It's those guys, the guys you're doing an impression of, Milo, they're fine. Because European yeah. governments are like, Jesus Christ, thank God. Okay, just keep being an industry. Mm. We're, we're too desperate and we know better to like fuck around with this. Whereas mm. the US is still powerful enough that like one guy can like turn it slightly on its axis. And all of a sudden you have guys in between like the bone saw and, and you know, the deep blue sea. If, if you're Rich Lesser or, you know, Todd yeah. Grunfels or whatever the first guy's name was. <laughs> Rich. I'm lesser rich than I used to be. Hey, <laughs> oh. if you're Bob Sternfuls and rich lesser, then you're like, well, wait a minute, no, no, no. Uh, this I was supposed to be immune from this kind of thing. This is yeah. going and doing this stuff for the Saudis. That's just like that's just that's just pay dirt. That's just getting a billion dollars exactly. to say, as you say, November. <laughs> what if Taylor Swift dated Phil Mickelson? Well, what if that? First of all, age gap discourse. That's what. <laughs> I mean, yeah, functionally, there is a kind of, like, capitalist diplomatic immunity there. You, you are, like, a, a, an ambassador from the kind of international non-country of wealth. Mm. And, you know, that's, that, that's something that the Saudis have been, like, reluctant to fuck with. So I wonder what's there that is making them this secretive about it. What I think is very funny, this is not, um, this is not going to be give any insight into what's there that's making them so secretive. I mean... Generally, I think it's just what they're doing is saying, no, no, this is our stuff. You can't take our stuff that we own, America. Like, they're trying a bit of a kind of very stupid power play. Oh, with the Saudis? That wild. I I read a golf magazine, a golf industry magazine called Playing Through, that had a really detailed (laughs) article about this. A golf industry magazine called Play Through. It sounds like a euphemism for shitting yourself. <laughs> when you said a golf industry magazine, I thought like, oh, so like Bahrain or like Oman or Qatar. Or well, the like, industry of being in the golf. <laughs> yeah, the, the being in the golf yeah. industry. Uh, hey, that's an industry for these guys. Well, no, there, there's yeah. also Golf Golf, which is a golf industry magazine about golf in the golf. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like when sometimes we become have I got news for you and we have like a publication of the week. Yeah. So, um, the uh, playing through interviewed, uh, you know, someone from like the uh, director of responsibility to protect and you know and and, and bombing uh, institute at um at, at a university. Where's that they named an institute that? You know what I mean. 
says, I think this is a strategic... Ben Freeman, the director of the Democratizing Foreign Policy Program at the Quincy Institute. Th- th- there's, uh, yeah, there's like 500,000 of these these types of guy in particular. Yeah, sure. Ben Freeman, it's in the name. He loves being free. Hmm. It's not like, like Ben Bonesword Man, does it? No. I, I think this is a strategic blunder for the consultancies. If you comply with these in- this inquiry, you adhere to the subpoenas, you provide the documents and everything... I don't think people would care as much, nor would they have as many questions as they do now. The fact that they obfuscate so much, it really looks like they have something to hide. And it's quite possible that not only will the principals of BCG, McKinsey, and so on have to register as foreign agents of the Saudi government, but famous golfers working in live might too. <laughs> so Phil Mickelson is going to have to register as a foreign agent. <laughs> Tiger Woods, Saudi agent. Uh, I'm I'm very here for this, actually. The infinite gravy train of uh, working for uh, the... The Saudis might, uh, let's say, be coming, reaching a bit of a squeaking place. I want to do one more, one more thing, one more little mm-hmm. thing uh, before we move on to the startup and then our sort of core topic about uh, what's going on with all those war crimes investigations in Britain. The, very, very, very quickly. I don't like spending too much time on the royals, but there's a bunch of royal stuff happening because the king... Or not happening, as the case may be. So the king is now um, officially dying. And dead. He's dead. He's yeah. dead. 100% dead. Look, I was right about the Queen. I'm going to be right about this as well. I'm mm-hmm. getting out ahead of it. Already dead. In the fucking ground already. Saudi economic yeah. collapse. King dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Saudi economic collapse. King dead. Uh, new shapes are being invented every day in the, like, tetrahedron beneath the Pentagon. Yeah. As a wise man once said, the King is absent. Long wait the King. <laughs> But well, the thing is, like Charles, Charles loves homeopathy and uh, hates modernity and doctors and all of this. And on that basis, like it's not looking good. Like it, it, I feel like cancer is one of those things that you really don't want to apply homeopathy and other kind of like useless treatments. Well, I mean, there's of... a guy in Glasgow who's like quite good at AI and has some ideas about how to resolve it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, maybe. and that guy is the unknown. I don't do homeopathy. I'm straight. <laughs> 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 just just like uh, talking to your oncologist and you're like you know obviously it's 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 very frightening in and of itself but mostly what i'm afraid of is the unknown and then, yeah. and then the guy fucking pops out <laughs> from behind the yeah. mirror well, that, no Wait. that guy in glasgow is now starting the king charles asshole experience where it's like all themes around the inside of the king's rectum. And you still only get half a cup of lemon squash yeah that's right mm. It's dyed brown. A bunch of Rangers fans crawling out there. <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, the sort of presumptive queen, uh, in waiting at least, appears to also have been now missing for like three months. Yeah, so, so this is a, an interesting little like, internet conspiracy theory that kind of isn't a conspiracy theory, where she, she had this like, operation and then she just hasn't been photographed mm. for, for, as you say, for months and months, which is, I don't care... Believe me, I care a great deal less than a lot of people, but like, it's weird. And you yeah. put these two things together, particularly this thing of like, you know, nobody's, nobody's seen the king, nobody's mm. seen uh, Kate together. And the only possible solution in my mind is that the, the royals are doing white people get out to each I, other. I was actually going to say, so I was going to say that. I feel like the, the actual answer to this is that they're doing face-off. <laughs> yeah, face-off, possible. in many ways, the white people get out anyway. Yeah. Um, the thing's got a bit weird, so now they both have the same face as Nicolas Cage. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the king, yeah. and you're going to no. listen to me. No, I, I, I'm serious. I, I think they're going to try and like put Charles's brain in Kate's body, and that's, you know, he's going to continue himself that way. Yeah. And then William will have the most normal sexual relationship anyone in that family has ever had <laughs> while right. fucking his hot dad. This is all an elaborate plot to, to make William's dad hot so that he can fuck him. <laughs> I think they've done reverse Die Another Day and they've made both King Charles and, and, and Kate Middleton Korean. <laughs> And they've just released so, no, them into the wild. No, it's fine. I just didn't expect it to be Korean. <laughs> yeah, that's, imagine if they did that and they just carried on as normal and didn't mention it at all. Like, because what would anyone do? Like, you couldn't, you know, even the British press would have to be like, do we, do we comment on this? <laughs> Trying to work out whether or not they should be racist. Like, there's nothing wrong with them being Korean. It's, just, it's unexpected. <laughs> 
Yeah, you just you just leave it to like Giles Corrin to write write an insanely racist yeah. column about it. Well, no, know? he's going to have to change. Again, you know, the the winds will have changed direction. He's going to have to become Giles Korean. <laughs> <laughs> He's just comparing every restaurant to, like, uh, you know, barbecue. <laughs> He's like the, they're not using the fresh gochujang at, uh, at Le Gavroche anymore. Well, there we go. That's why we podcast, <laughs> folks. There you go, Giles Korean. <laughs> There's a thought. Yeah, <laughs> what if it was that? Uh, just make it the fucking episode title. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool, done, tick. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but at, at the same time, right, D- Donald Trump has said Prince Harry's going to be on his own if I get back in. The funniest the possible thing for him to take a position on. It's like, bro, you, you are quite possibly going to be president again. Th- there's like 50 cases against you. And what, th- this, is, this is why Trump is the way he is, because what's he commenting on? He's selling you like gold sneakers. And he's being like, Prince Harry, very, very unfair to his racist family. He's not even Korean. <laughs> the rest of the family, they weren't Korean. They did poke. They're reading, they're reading kimchi. This is, this is why it. Trump got on so well with Kim Jong-un, you know? Prince Harry says, oh, oh, I don't want to be Korean. Why are they cracking a raw egg into my rice? I don't like it. I don't want to be, I don't like a strict social hierarchy based on age. I don't care for that at all. No, he'd rather come over here. Pr- Prince Harry refusing to start counting his age at one. I yeah. d- genuinely, though, I, it's why people get out. I think that, like, Diana was the early case study for this. And I think that the royals, as the white people of white people, are trying to do the fucking coagula procedure. And mm. that's why we haven't seen yeah. any of them. Riley has sent me a Donald Trump quote to read. This out. is what he said. This is what he said I about Harry. I would protect him. He's betrayed the Queen. That's unforgivable. He'd be on his own if it was down to me. <laughs> <laughs> no. We have an important rule in this hive. You don't betray the Queen. <laughs> I'm a worker. I'm like everyone else. I'm a worker. We gotta protect the honey. We got lots of honey in the hive, haven't we? We love the honey, don't we, folks? But they don't want to make it anymore because of woke. <laughs> Just br- briefly, the reason he said he yeah. wouldn't protect him is that Harry's visa in the U.S., because he said he did drugs once in a book, like, well, technically you shouldn't have been given, is the Heritage Foundation has launched a legal case to get him deported this out of spite. This is so fucking weird. Like, w- imagine caring mm-hmm. about this, especially as an American. Like, not to, like, buy into their national bullshit too much, but did, they had a war not to care about this. Mm-hmm. Benedict Arnold would have been a very respectful guy, in my opinion. <laughs> Being, like, an American who cares about the monarchy, particularly an American who cares about the monarchy, like, positively, is some of the most cooked you can be, in my opinion. It's so many of them, though. It's, yeah. It's like the Brits who are into the NFL. <laughs> I, I have a startup, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Jonathan Mercer, a man who's, uh, a man who's oh, yeah. always trolling Mercer. the Plymouth Herald comment section. That's right. Mm, Johnny Mercenary. Be one last chance at yeah. honesty. I'll give you all one last chance at honesty. Clue. Q L double O. Clue. 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 Are we going to be like Levantine Arabic? It would be like clue. 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 It doesn't help me very much. It's a Swedish type of quaalude. This is what we're replacing detectives with after we abolish police. Yeah, that's right. DCI Gene Hunt is going to, his consciousness will be uploaded into clue. Fire up the quattro. Clue. Clue is the leading AI platform on culture and taste. Ooh. Oh, okay. Yeah, providing consumer taste data and recommendations for leading companies in the entertainment, publishing, retail, travel, hospitality, and packaged goods sectors. Wait, so so it's 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 like a survey thing. It's like your your phone grabs you and goes like, Do you like this? Do you like this, you piece of shit? Tell us. <laughs> I'm DCIG none, and I'm gonna tell you if it's proper stuff or if it's for fucking pansies. <laughs> Their proprietary API predicts consumers' preferences mm-hmm. and tastes across a dozen major categories, including music, film, television, podcast, dining, light, light, nightlife, fashion, consumer products, books, and travel. Launched in 2012 as a re- taste recommendation engine, so basically as like a Groupon add-on, Clue mm-hmm, sure. now claims to combine the latest in machine learning, research in neuroaesthetics, and a pipeline of detailed taste data. You can't say neuroaesthetics because all that suggests to me is what your brain looks like. In this case, very smooth. 
He's got a very ugly brain. I've seen the scans. It's a very peculiar brain. Basically, right? What it says it is. Oh my god. Have you seen have you seen the Trump tweet where like he manually retweets? This is back in the old days. A guy says your dad gives good brain and he retweets it with it's called jeans. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yes, I have seen that. An icon. No. This basically this thing. It's an AI black box. And what it uh-huh. says is it has all of these data inputs, you know, like this to people. Mm-hmm. Age, where they are, uh, what they've bought, what they like, and so on. Yeah. And says it has 500, it, it can predict any, any taste ever. And what it says it wants to do essentially is more or less take over the cultural industry to AI generate basically whatever companies will do, more or less, hmm. which cool. is great. Now, but what they say is, no, we're not like an open, it's not like chat GPT. We're not, it's not like we've, mm-hmm. we're just scraped like Reddit to turn, to, to create the unknown. Uh, rather, they have control over their data sources, which means that they just ask people, either they buy data or they ask people stuff. And you ask how they, how they got that data. It's because in 2012, when they got a whole bunch of money for, um, from Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> and Cedric what? the Entertainer. What? 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 It's... Uh... So he reinvested his like fee for Killers of the Flower Moon or whatever. No, no, into... in 2012. Oh, excuse me. Oh, it's Wolf me. of yeah, Wall okay. Street money. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, that explains a lot about how dumb this is then. Cedric the Entertainer, then Leonardo DiCaprio, and Elton John uh, have all Walk put a bunch a of bar. money. Into, yeah, and all invest in, in something in 2012. Yeah. Well, you've got Cedric the Entertainer, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Elton John in a boat, and also a cabbage and chicken. And you have to ferry them across from one side to the other. <laughs> so this is from 2013 and how it started. Whenever you sign into Clue, you, we ask you for five clues about your taste in things, mm-hmm. co-founder Jay Alger told Stylecaster. Basically, we just ask you for what you love, favorite movie, fashion brand, book, or whatever. And we map the data together. So basically, if, you, if I say, well, I like, um, I don't trash know. Trash Future. <laughs> yeah, sure. I like the Trash Future podcast. I will mm. in four years like the Trash Future podcast. This is from 2013. Hmm. Stop sending me milfs. <laughs> <laughs> I also really like, I don't know, the, the sh- TV show Burn Notice. And then if someone else likes Thrash Future, it'll say, have you considered trying Burn Notice? That's basically all it did, mm. right? <laughs> gotcha. Have you considered trying building a more equitable society in the lagoon? <laughs> <laughs> so you let the app know that you're obsessed with a brand like Rag and Bone. And it says, based on your taste mm. in Rag and Bone, we think in Chicago, you might like the following restaurants, more or less. Says something like Yelp okay, is more generic. Sure. One restaurant has five stars, one has three. I love Rag and Bone, they buy all my scrap metal. But whether you're Donald Trump or a protester, you get told the same thing. It's almost dictatorial. But we are forming a taste profile to give recommenda- you recommendations specific to you. So this quite like rudimentary recommendation engine sort of doesn't do much from 2013 to 20, I don't know, 19. And then people start talking about AI and hey presto, all of a sudden, they acquire mo- another big pipeline of data, this company called Taste Dive, and then are able, again, taking this relatively limited amount of people with these relatively limited amount of connections, they're able to then go to Coca Cola and be like, we can tell you exactly what celebrities to put on your can if you want um, people who live in Chicago and drive forklifts uh, who were born yeah, in July. Harold Shipman. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Weirdly. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know who he is. He's just got the right face for Chicago forklift drivers. In fact, the fact they don't know who he is is a bonus. Here's what I think is actually interesting about this: is the, you know what the company has just invested a huge amount of money into Clue, hmm. AXA, the insurers. Oh, good. good. Okay, you you liked something that was bad for you, and your <laughs> premiums are going to go up. Oh well, like people who like Trash Future, they like drink driving, for example. Exactly, or like you know vaping or <laughs> something else terrible. But for that's you. The, not even you liked vaping. You liked something that people who like vaping like. Every day of my fucking life, we invent the social credit system again. <laughs> And it gets it gets worse and stranger and like less related to anything every time. Now we haven't said exactly why AXA is inv- to be clear. AXA hasn't said why they're investing in it, and Clue hasn't said what they're doing with the money from AXA. But we know what happened, what it means when an insurance company invests in a huge pipeline of pers- of like data analytics. It means that they're, yeah, they're going to use, use it responsibly. Yeah, yeah, of course, always. Yeah, like alcohol. Hmm. Yeah, they're going to find a way 
to get more premiums out of people and pay them out less because that's the insurance industry business model. And so I don't understand what else an insurance company would be doing investing in a thing that tells you what restaurants you would like if you like a certain clothing brand, other than just further stratification of people into, into good or bad risks based on whether it's like, well, someone who likes, I don't know, Trailer Park Boys uh, has great taste in TV. And so we're going to charge them lower premiums. Great taste in TV, but like terrible uh, conception of risk, you know? And as such, premiums kind of balance out much yeah. the same. But so, and, and this is, uh, as you say, right, every, every day we build more of the, of the social credit system, but this is the social credit system that also helps like Netflix make their, you know, next terrible movie. If you're wondering like, what are the sys- AI systems that are like helping Netflix to generate stuff? Yeah, it's what they bought in house, but they claim as well, like again, always takes when startups make grandiose claims about who they work with, always take that with a grain of salt. Hmm. So, so, so for instance, you, you, you liked uh, a Kevin Hart special and <laughs> Grey Goose Vodka and the concept of theft. Therefore, Netflix has now made the movie Lift. Which we will, I, we will not do another call forward to an episode coming out in May. Wait, what episode are you talking about? Oh, it's the episode coming out in May where we watch the Kevin Hart Netflix Yeah, the movie, movie that we haven't watched yet for the episode yeah, that we haven't yet recorded. I- exactly. I, I Genuinely, I got uh, a message from someone who was like, thank you for doing the call forward jokes because it makes me like, so I know what's coming. I subscribe to the Patreon based off of that. So all I'm going to be talking about between now and May is the movie Lift. Mm. Uh, so, you know, thank you to that person. <laughs> Let's just do a, 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 why don't we just do another episode about Lift? Fuck it. We're going to yeah. watch Lift again. Watch it a second time in a way that comes out earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Tenet. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. The listeners who are moving backwards through the feed will understand it. <laughs> That's just someone, I guess, catching up on a podcast. <laughs> That's what you're describing. Yeah, yeah. Slapping up my red patch to move and catch up to the thing. Yeah. yeah. But, right, if let, let the, uh, we don't know if they're actually working with Netflix, right? But if they are, then the same machine that's making the Kevin Hart, that's saying, you gotta put Kevin Hart with uh, Vincent D'Onofrio and have him sort of steal an (laughs) NFT for the quote-unquote first time ever. And then a Chicago Polish welder will buy a Coke. Yeah, the same thing is being bought by insurers, which is great fun. Again, also, oh, just it, when, if something is being invested in by an insurance company's venture arm, it could come to nothing. But it also shows what are they interested in? What do they think the frontiers are of what they're going to be able to do with information? Hmm. I mean, in, in that case, they're, I guess, quite optimistic about this in a way that is depressing. Oh, good. That's uh, just a quick one uh, for Clue. I want to finish this off by asking, what the hell is going on in the... Did we do oopsie boopsie? Did we do war crimes in Afghanistan inquiry that Johnny Mercer seems to be fronting? Yes. So uh, basically, this has been a fairly long running public inquiry investigating allegations that, as you say, uh, particularly the SAS during the course of the war in Afghanistan committed a shitload of war crimes, most of them on the theme of killing unarmed civilians in houses they raided, and then fitting them up to make them look like terrorists, right? Mm. Like, carrying an extra, like, an AK with you, and, like, sprinkling some AK on the guy's body who you just shot for no reason. And Johnny Mercer, veterans minister, ex-troop himself, is now in this position where he's he's testified to the inquiry um, that he knows about some war crimes that they did, but... He's not going to tell them about it. And I think it's so funny that what you've got here is a Tory MP who is essentially forced into a conflict of personal honour, the likes of which you don't see outside the samurai or the Gambino crime family. <laughs> because he's, he's like, genuinely, he's going, well, I have people telling me that they did war crimes or that they were ordered to commit war crimes or asked to commit war crimes. And then the, you know, the judge in charge of the inquiry says, well, will you name them so that we can investigate it? And he goes, no, because as a, as a former army officer, I love the army and I don't want to, like, I didn't want to believe it and I don't want to like, impugn the reputation of it. And so you have this strange thing where the guy is essentially talking, he's violating Omerta 
by talking about how cool he thinks the Omerta is and how much he believes in it. Yeah, and nice. <laughs> I think it's really funny that like you've ended up in this situation where like he's not he's not willing to testify in a way that sates the body that like can actually compel him to do that. But in the course of saying how he won't do that, he has pissed off everyone involved so badly that he may as well have done. It's like if Serpico never actually ratted on anyone. If he was just like, no, I won't take a bribe, and everyone around him was like, this motherfucker, he must be, he must be dirty. The only know? way they could get Johnny Mercer to testify against these men would be if some of these, you know, former soldiers were to have insinuated that Johnny Mercer's wife was a prostitute on the Plymouth Herald comments section. <laughs> <laughs> then that would free him from his Bushido code of honor. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it is genuine, like, it's it's serious, obviously, because, like, in particular, the stuff that he's describing, the place where there is no love lost is between him and, like, senior army officers, like, generals, right? And he, he describes, uh, like, how he went to the then director of special forces, a guy called um, Roland Walker, and went, hey, is any of this true? It seems like it might be, and it probably shouldn't be, because it's bad. And the guy just, like, kind of, like, shrugs his shoulders at him. And I think it's worth mentioning that, because that guy, that general that he talked to, is going to be the next chief of the general staff. And I think hmm. a lot of the army is like in this kind of stranglehold of former <laughs> special forces officers, right? Uh, because it, it was something that like sounded cool and tactical and was selective and elite, and people thought that that was all the army was going to be doing until Ukraine. Uh, and so now all of the guys who covered this shit up and who are now getting like thoroughly embarrassed by Johnny Mercer in a way that like previously people who embarrassed people like that ended up you know inside the boots of their own cars those people are now basically untouchable because they're in those positions in in the hierarchy anyway and it's just it's it's really grim but at the same time i have sort of like i i'm trying to decide whether or not i feel bad for johnny mercer because by instinct i never want to feel bad for a tory mp and uh, his previous kind of like cause was preventing historical prosecutions of war crimes in Northern Ireland. But when he was confronted with like the modern incarnation, he was like, oh, well, this like offends my sense of honor in a way that I'm like now torn between the institution. I, I almost respect him for like earnestly believing it, you know, to his real detriment. Well, it's a, Johnny Mercer to me seems like someone who was always meant to be a kind of propaganda officer. Hmm. Artillery, close enough. <laughs> yeah. No one has ever, I think, believed so much in the importance of a of Britain abroad. You might say, no, there is. Mm. There are very few Tories who are still as, or very few front bench Tories who are still as concerned with Britain doing army stuff rather than culture war stuff. Like he's on the the right yeah. side of the culture war of the early two thousands. Which basically makes him a liberal by today's standards. Yeah, he's he's basically like General Wesley Clark. Yeah, as insane as that is to be like, no, to to do these war crimes, like uh, obviously to investigate the war crimes is very bad, but to like do them in the first place is is shameful. And it's it's like that weird kind of halfway house that you land in of of like, well, we we certainly shouldn't do anything about it mm. because you know you you, uh, you cover the institution's nakedness first is. What I sort of I, I'm sort of instinctively thinking of here as well is the the American special forces are well again American special forces have been allowed to um, let's say I don't run large scale drug smuggling rings for a, for a long time mm. but they seem sure. to be able to do it now um, more as freelancers and for themselves rather than I don't know for the institution itself and there's but there is this. It, it seems unthinkable that there would be a sim something similar happening in the States, if you get my meaning. Yeah, for sure. Well, because also, like, when, you know, like, the, the British Special Forces do some war crimes, but, like, the, the American Special Forces do, like, parody war crimes. Like, mm. the, the Navy SEALs went into a village and shot everyone, and then were like, yeah, they were all terrorists, bye. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it's like... But well, that was this. That was genuinely this. It was It was the same thing. It's just it was done with, like more Britishness about it. And I think that's the distinction, right? Is mm. that, like, because we we don't have the same kind of, like, even, like, disconnection from the troops that Americans have. We have this, like, entirely different relationship to our military. What happened is we ended up with, like, a pretty British cover-up, which is that, like, you know, a, a guy with a lot of, kind of, insignia on just kind of, like, shrugs his shoulders mm. at it. 
the thing that I always come back to is there was this email that the, the Royal Military Police, they investigated this, and then their investigation got like shut down without uncovering anything. It was part of the cover-up. But they found this email from an SAS like regimental sergeant major who was, and the subject line was like, another massacre in like all caps with like f- five exclamation marks with the kind of like world weary tone of like, mm. y- you know, like, oh, they've fucking done it again. Yeah, I remember we read all thing. those like the, the yeah. officers' reports as well <laughs> when they were writing mm-hmm. up stuff that had been handed to them by like sergeants and stuff and they were just like, Another grenade hidden behind a curtain. You couldn't make it up in block capitals. Yeah, exactly, was exactly. Um, and and so now Johnny Mercer is like caught in the middle of this. Um, and I mean, it's very very strange, you know, because I don't think there are many politicians left who would be compromised by a sense of like personal feeling mm. like this. He's gonna have know? to go on the rest is politics now. That's the only <laughs> way forward. <laughs> He's going to be slightly tougher Rory Stewart. Yeah, I mean, basically, what, what this is waiting for is for someone to see this happening, go, okay, well, clearly, like, trying to do the, like, change within the system thing doesn't work. Even trying to lightly criticise the system in a way that still covers for it uh, doesn't work. The only option is to leak a shitload of documents to journalists. And on the off chance we have any listeners slightly outside Hereford who are waiting to do that, please... It is the only thing that moves the needle on this. Now, um, I think that there are other there are other elements of this as well, right? Which is just sort of going mm. back to the um, going back to the that this is larger than you know this the management of the institution, right? This is the cover yeah. up goes goes even goes even wider, where like the SAS is blo- was blocking UK visas for Afghan mm. soldiers, basically because they were like, well, you you saw us do this. So if you come here, you may tell someone. Yeah, because there was this breakdown where the these Afghan special forces units like refused to go out with the uh, with the SAS with UK special forces because of the war crimes they were committing. And now, now that these sort of like Afghan special forces guys are trying to get visas to come to the UK, that's exactly what's happening. Is that like the SAS have a veto and they go, well, no, because this guy like saw us commit war crimes. And it's it's just it's deeply deeply cynical in a way that's you know familiar to anyone who knows anything about British military history, but in a way that I think Johnny Mercer particularly finds like personally embarrassing and shameful, and and so now is is put into this strange kind of situation where he's like, well, I'm gonna say that I know that it happened and that there are witnesses, but not who any of them are, you know, and I, I think that's a really odd hill to die on, you know? Johnny number one. We know Johnny Mercer loves an odd hill to die on. That is like one of the main things about this per- Well, I mean, he was in the British Army at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> but he was on a hill four miles behind the hill that the other people were dying on, so he'd have had to have been pretty unfortunate to die on it. <laughs> it would have been an odd hill to die on. Yeah, at the same time, I think we, all, we also know that, like, that- Britain is, especially when it comes to its its military, a kind of a a country str- a country struggling for relevance, you know, uh, eager mm. to get involved in any war and commit any atrocity, so that it can be seen as serious. And yeah. you know, to again see to see, I think almost the the naivety of someone like Mercer, who was kind of who was sort of so dismayed that mm. the the story did not line up with the reality. Such that he was willing to basically lie to the House of Commons multiple times. You know that it would be that it is. It is just a an, another. I think lens on the on this particular on this country having a kind of um, uh, what you call it a small dog short leg syndrome. Are you, are you suggesting that we could like meaningfully push Johnny Mercer to the left? We could we could make him woke on this. <laughs> we could make Johnny. I think we could do more than that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not so much that, but that it is it is qu- it is quite telling what does and doesn't get discussed as well, and it is I think yeah it's it's unfortunate as as per usual that you know that all of the um the institutions around it whether that's the m o d or the or the press really are making it once again more about the question of did he lie rather than how come a bunch of you know Hereford guys living just outside Hereford have ear necklaces if you know what I mean mm, yeah for sure. Anyway, if I look at the old old timer, I think that's once again probably all we have time for today. So 
I want to thank once again everyone for listening. Uh, remind you that there is a Patreon for five dollars a month. You can subscribe to it. You can get second episodes every week. Uh, you can get Britonologies. You can get Left Unread. You know the deal. Yeah. You can be Johnny Mercer if you subscribe to the hundred dollar tier. You can be Johnny Mercer if you subscribe to the. That's right. We will yeah. send you a birth certificate. Says Johnny Mercer. Well, you can go to the immersive Johnny Mercer experience, <laughs> where people on the Plymouth Herald comment section insinuate that your wife is a prostitute. <laughs> the unknown keeps uh, talking about Johnny Mercer's wife, and yeah. so it uh, ends with Johnny Mercer fighting the unknown. Yeah. Mm. Well, you're three miles away from the unknown, <laughs> but you, you have a map and a radio, and people are radioing you the coordinates of the unknown and saying things like splash, drop, drop 20, <laughs> fire for effect. <laughs> also, please buy tickets to my Australian tour. It's soon. Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, Newcastle, Canberra, Adelaide, Perth, all of those dates available tickets buy them thanks alice springs sorry my website mm. sorry Gushing. alice springs there is <laughs> there is a show in alice springs but you can't come <laughs> um, I'm, do- I'm doing my secret racist hour in alice springs <laughs> under a pseudonym johnny mercer <laughs> it's called the willy wonka experience <laughs> yeah that's right we also are doing a live show live show live oh, show yeah. live show live show 13th of march yeah there might be a special guest who may be may or may not be the unknown yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. it's unknown who the guest might <laughs> that's be. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes, that's right. So do come to that. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, we will see you on the bonus episode in a couple short days. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.